at the end of this week's show, I get excited. Hi, welcome to episode 58 of Business Greenhouse TV. Just a little update here at Greenhouse HQ. I'm currently in a training month. So um, I've been in, I spent a week in Sydney, week on the Gold Coast, back in the office today, back to Melbourne this week and Perth the next week. So um, I just love getting around the country and training our clients. You know, this particular training is amazing. We spend one entire day on sales and sales processes and sales scripts and how to think like a good salesperson. Uh, then we spend a day on hearing the voice of God stronger than we do right now for business, which is amazing. I actually bring a third party company in for that. And then we spend a day doing nothing but the work. So all our clients have their computers open and they're grinding out Facebook ads and Google ads and all that sort of stuff. So it's a really, really, really cool time. Um, but it doesn't give me a huge amount of time to put out videos like this. So, uh, so today is a real treat. All right, what's our first question? Janet Stark asks, how often should you email your clients on your mailing list? Don't want them to just hit the delete button or forget about you. You know, Janet, this is a question I do get a bit, um, you know, because if you look at the history with email, you know, back when email or bulk email started, you know, open rates on emails was nearly 100%. You know, like back then when, when somebody got an email, they like read everything, the subject line, the headline, every word, you know, and, and those emails had in them, you know, like this and this tip and the recipe of the month and the winter warmers and like, you know, these emails were, it was, because people hadn't time allegedly back then to sit and read. You know, what's it like today? Today, global open rates on emails are at 13%, you know, across, you know, that's, that's the, the average across all industries. It, it, you know, it's come a long way and, uh, and it's only come down. Why has that happened is the answer to your question. It's happened because there's really no value in them. People do not value the content because they've become a sales pitch, a one way sales pitch. And that's the reason why they don't work. That's the reason why people uh, delete or unsubscribe. The answer to your question, how often, um, is as often as you've got something really, really valuable for them. I don't mean something you've got a great deal to sell them, all right? If it's sale, 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 they're gonna bail because it's just the way we are. We don't have time for them anymore. Like, I go out of my way all the time to unsubscribe from everything because I don't want the, you know, the, the distraction of an email come in that, that doesn't add value to me but I'll keep the ones that are giving me value, hints, tips, this, that, and everything else. Okay, I'll keep them. So the, to answer your question, how often, will all come down to your ability to give value. Um, you can ask for the sale, but you can't ask for the sale without building value first. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a set of scales, the relationship, you've, you know, or a bank account. You've got, you've got to make deposits before you can make withdrawals. You've got to give tons and tons of value and then ask for something, and then go back to giving value and then ask for something, all right? So many people have got a one-way communication, buy this offer, 20% off, 10% off, two for one, buy this, get this. We, we just don't care as consumers. And the minute we think that you don't care, we're out. You know, so, so I mean, a monthly is a guide, but that's certainly not a, you know, a rule of thumb. I know in our organization, and our open rate is currently, it goes between sort of 70 to 75, 76% on, on average, like consistently in that number, which is insanely high. Why? because we, I don't ask for anything ever. I've got nothing to sell ever because I've reverse engineered a different way to sell. I use my email for nothing more than brand awareness uh, and to give tons and tons of value. I use a different way to make my asks and I only send stuff that the market tell me is valuable, right? So I'll put, a, I'll put out a video on Facebook. If the market love it, I'll put it into my email newsletter. If the market don't love it, I won't put it into my email newsletter. That way I know that the market are telling me that I'm only sending out stuff that the market find valuable. So I send it out that way, okay? Do we get unsubscribes? Of course we get unsubscribes, okay? But we have more people joining our list than we do getting rid of it, which means it's getting bigger and bigger every single week. So, so that's part of it. Now, you know, you may only send once every quarter if that's all you can do in terms of, you know, giving a huge amount of value. You might send once every fortnight if you've got a way to give massive value. We go through seasons. I'll give, I'll give an email every single week through a season and then I'll stop on purpose. Even though we've got other goods, I'll stop because I don't just want to be that standard Tuesday afternoon email in anybody's 
email box. I'll go in, do lots, and then I'll bail, and I'll spend two months with no email, then I'll go back in because it's fresh, and it means I've got a reason to contact people, okay? Rather than that, you know, that boring old consistency thing. So that's what I do. I hop in and out just to kind of make it fresh all of the time. But I want to kind of, you know, that, that's like the obvious answers, but I want to I want to go a little bit deeper with what you can do. If you've got a list of email addresses that you're emailing, did you know you can take those as a CSV file, comma separated value, load them into Facebook, okay, and match those people up with a Facebook profile, okay? And it'll match about 60 to 70% of those people. If, if somebody has ever used the email address that you've got attached to a Facebook account ever, it'll match them up, and then you can start pushing your newsletter um, in their Facebook feed, which has got a much higher open rate, much higher conversion rate than email, drawing them back to your website to read it, okay? So, so you could take your emails, put them into Facebook, um, and then start pushing your email newsletter to them in Facebook, okay? To me, it, like, it's only gonna cost you dollars to get that attention. So you're gonna go out of your way to make a newsletter, you're gonna send it to your database, and you're gonna get a 13% open rate. Great, also put it into Facebook, spend a few bucks, and get a 70% open rate, because that's where the action is. People are spending more time on Facebook than they are digesting emails, all right? So same effort goes to put into producing a newsletter, but you can get way more people to read it by putting it into Facebook. By the way, that, that theory of taking email addresses, putting them into Facebook, that's not just for newsletters. You can push any marketing to anybody on that list ever, which is just a phenomenal strategy that you should all be doing. But how often should you push? Oh, you can push more frequently on Facebook than you can inside an email newsletter. You can push daily different content on Facebook. You know, that's acceptable on Facebook. It's not acceptable to send an email every day. You, by playing, by taking the emails and building an audience on Facebook, you can market way more often, build way more value, and make way more requests to buy. Great question. Annika Ross asks, how much online learning content is too much? So much is out there. So many good podcasts. Where do you start and stop? Annika, um, I think uh, Einstein said it best when he said, there comes a time in every man's life when he needs to stop learning and start doing. You know, it's great, right, to be learning, and we should always be learning. Otherwise, we get a bit crusty, especially in a world that's changing every five minutes. You know, if you're... You know, if, if your knowledge of Facebook, for example, is the 2015 version of the platform, then you're going to go backwards real fast. You know, if you're still doing your accounting according to the 2010 tax code, you're going to get into trouble. So this whole thing is shifting, 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 shifting. So you've got to stay across that. But I'm not a fan of learning for learning's sake. I think the answer to your question is, is there something you really need to learn right now? A topic, Facebook marketing, email newsletters, HR, you know, the latest changes with baby boomers and millennials and the latest awards and like, you know, there's a million different things. For me, what I do is I go super intense and super deep on whatever I really need to know right now. And then if I don't need to know anything, there's no learning. And then I work out whatever the next thing is and I go super deep and I go with that. What I don't do is I don't go learning by listening to everything under the sun. Um, had you said, had you said in your question, inspiration, that's a different story because then you can go to podcasts and they might inspire you. You know, for me, I'm like the world's worst runner, although I'm trying to give it a crack. So I find that I can run better when I listen to running podcasts because it's kind of like in the moment, you know, relevant and it spurs me on badly. And I have to have long pod podcasts, you know, to keep me out, to be able to get through a kilometer. Um, but, you know, so, so that's like inspiration. I'm learning anything. I'm just hearing great stories of great runners and yada, yada, yada. Okay. But when it comes to learning, I don't think, I don't think a smart entrepreneur learns for the sake of learning. I think a smart entrepreneur just basically goes, cool, here's the three things I want to learn in 2018. Bang, bang, bang. Go super intense. Learn them. Get the information. Make sure you've retained it and use it and then go and learn something else. So here's my question for you and everybody watching. What are the three things you need to learn in the next 12 months? Not the 33 things, because you won't be able to go deep. What are the three things that you absolutely need to learn and master and get the small distinctions on so that you know them well enough that you can use them well, all right? I reckon there's probably only three things you could possibly, three big things you could learn in a year. I mean, you could learn how to make cupcakes, right, in, in, uh, in five minutes, but I'm talking like, you know, something big. If you need to learn the franchising code of conduct, that's probably a 12-month journey to be able to learn that and all the precedents of the case law that go with it. 
Let's not learn for the sake of learning. Let's work out exactly what we need and go super deep with that one thing until we have mastery over it, which means we understand the small distinctions and then we use it and then we move on rather than just learning for learning's sake. Great question, Annika. All right, let's go to word of the week. All right, this week we are going to Ecclesiastes, that book that everyone's a little bit unsure about. Like, is it a guy that is suffering depression? Is, he seems a little bit off, doesn't really fit the rest of the Bible. Well, it's a book of wisdom. It's a book of wisdom, just like Psalms, just like Proverbs. It is a book of wisdom, okay? And, and so, you know, one of the things for me, the reason why I picked this scripture is because, you know, I try and spot trends, you know, I get to see thousands of Christian entrepreneurs a year and I get to meet them and talk to them and some of them I go deeper because I spend more time with them and some of them not, but I get to kind of see this helicopter view. And one of the things that I consistently come up against is there aren't many people in the Christian business world who are really happy. There's not a spirit of joy that is a, that's bouncing around the Christian business community, you know, like, where, whereas I do see, I do, I do see that spirit of joy with those kind of like revivalists, you know, those people that just hive themselves off from society, hang around in their little bubble and run glory tunnels and chase gold dust and rubies and fairies and feathers and all this sort of stuff. Like, like I understand, like, that they seem to have a spirit of joy, which is easy to understand. They don't have to do anything in the marketplace where you get knocked down and, you know, punched, you know, so, so, but, but there's something to be learned from those people who, who, who live in that world, except it just won't work for us. So, you know, when, when we talk about joy, when we talk about happiness, you know, Ecclesiastes gives us a, a, a very, very interesting perspective. And it's 180 degrees opposed to what society says right now will, will make you happy or, or be joyful. Society says right now, you know, you know and, and you can find this out by watching TV, watching the you know, newspaper, looking at Instagram and Facebook. You, you will only really experience joy when, when you have a, a, a jet, your own private jet, um, your own cash gold reserves, uh, a tiger uh, in your bedroom, um, supercars, um, you know, like gold, like a, a whole series of watches and you hold them up in front of your supercar steering wheel and yada, yada, yada. Like, like that's what we've created. Like that, like when you tick that box, that's when you're happy. You know, it's like, it's, it's just utter madness. You know, society basically says to you, you'll be happy at the next level. You'll be happy at the next level. Then when you get there, no, you'll be happy at the next level. And then when you get there, you'll be happy at the next level. The problem is there's no limit to levels, right? You know, everyone, like, the, the, can you spend $5 million on a car? Yes. And then when somebody starts spending $5 million, there'll be a $10 million car. And then, you know, just yada, yada. It's like, it's just, we're never going to stop. So you can never win that game. You can never win that game. And let me tell you, you won't be more joyful at the next level. You won't. You won't. You'll just be more of what you already are now. I'll just be more of what I already am now, all right? It's just the way it works. Ecclesiastes, though, kind of peels back and gives us a bit of an idea. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20 says this. This is what I have observed to be good. It's appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and find satisfaction in their toilsome labor. Okay, so toil, uh, so satisfaction in some other um, references in the Bible are happiness and joy. Okay, under the sun during the few days of life that we get given, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Okay, The bit that I really love there is when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, their work. So, so it's, never, it's never an event right, that can bring you happiness and joy. Right now, I understand business. Business is a hard game for a long period of time. That's why I want to talk about it because we can learn from Ecclesiastes that happiness, joy, is a choice. Irrespective of what you've got right now, whether you're still paying off your overdraft, whether you've got millions of dollars in spare cash, whether you spend your life traveling the country preaching, whether you you know you're going through a really hard time in the family, the decision is just to choose joy. It's accepting your lot in life that this, like today, this is my lot in life and I'm happy with it. Like, 
it, it, you know, to think like that is almost strange in 2017. Everyone wants you to think, no, but more, you, you gotta be more, you gotta have more, you gotta have more, great. Pursue more, I'm pursuing more. I'm pursuing more of everything. More business opportunities, more cash, more people in my seminars, more, 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 more relationships with my family, more, like I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing more. This is not instead of, this is as well as. Pursue more, go hard, work hard, do the things, but in the moment, in the moment, choose joy because anything else is way too hard, way too hard. Find ways to reward yourself, find ways to enjoy it. In fact, here's a little statement that I chose to live by. If you don't enjoy the journey, you won't endure the journey. You've got to find ways to experience joy because the journey from starting a business to becoming very, very successful financially you know, and influential in business takes such a long time that if you don't find ways to enjoy it, you will not get to the end. So it'll just wear you out, it'll wear you down, you'll become so miserable that you won't see it to pass. We've got to choose joy in the moment. Just choose joy right now, irrespective of what's going on. Except this is my lot for today, and I'm gonna be happy in it, but I'm gonna pursue more tomorrow, and this is my, and every single step of the journey, we just make a decision that I turn on the spirit of joy today, no matter what I'm facing. That is when nothing can control you. That is when you become a free person, because you're not driven by external circumstance. You just make the choice, that you are gonna walk in a spirit of joy. And by the way, it's the most freeing way to live so that you end up with a higher chance of success because you're just a happier person on the way through. So reward yourself, have things. I mean, I mean, you don't need to have cruises. Right? You don't need to go on a cruise. That's a $5,000 expense that you could have spent on your business getting customers, which at one point might make you a little bit happy. But you've gotta find ways to enjoy it. It could be as simple as, you know, taking your spouse down to the water's edge and sharing a sandwich together on a Tuesday afternoon when you'd normally be at work. It could be, you know, going and spending some time with the kids somewhere. Like, you don't have to spend money to, to, to have good experiences, okay? You can just find joy in the smallest of smallest of smallest things and life gets pretty sweet when you do. That's it, folks. I hope that was super valuable for you. I'll see you next week. Bye for now.